Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to another episode of Esoteric Atlanta, another deep dive with our friend Stephanie from Spiritual Perspectives of Our Great Awakening. How are you doing, Stephanie? Doing good. How about yourself? Girl, it's been a weird week, hasn't it? It has. I don't know like if I'm coming or going, what's up, what's down, what's good, what's bad. It's been wild, hasn't it? Yeah. And it's like information is like being thrown at us so fast that you don't know what is real and what's not. Yep. Yep. It's just, um, I mean, we were promised a very Merry Christmas at some point. So let's just hope that it was, it's this Christmas because last Christmas, we thought it was last Christmas and the Christmas was for that. We thought it was that Christmas. So let's just hope as we go into this December month that we're heading into, uh, the, <clears throat> the Christmas, but who yeah. knows? we might still be here doing these shows this time next year too, because it's all God's timing, right? Let's, let's just manifest before the end of the year. Let's now, not think about it. <laughs> now, before we started filming, you told me something, something, something interesting that doesn't have a lot to do with our topic for today, but I want to talk about it before we get into the topic today. What's this? What's tomorrow? This eclipse thing. And you said, how many years has it been since this eclipse has well, happened? I see. I've seen like a couple different articles on it. Well, and I think it was the Weather Channel. And like I told you, I don't fully trust what they say because they're very, you know, they push a lot of, you know, stuff with our uh, weather. If you mm -hmm. get my gist, I don't know what I can say on YouTube with that. Um, but something from that channel said every 6,000 years, but then I saw every 580 years. So I said to myself, that's interesting if it was 6,000 years, because how many years did God give the keys to earth to Satan for? And 6, I said, um, yeah. So does tomorrow mark the day where the key to the abyss to lock up our, uh, that, you know, that, that demonic beast, dragon, whatever you want to call him, serpent, is he going to go bye-bye for a thousand years? Maybe. Because we know yeah. that God te keeps time by the stars, by astrology, yeah. and the eclipses. <coughs> so this is something I thought of. It's interesting. It's interesting to pay something to pay attention to. And we've been so robbed of that information, you know, because we've been taught most of our lives that studying the stars is demonic and satanic, but it's not because God, who, who made the stars? God did. Yeah. The, the true God. Yeah. So like, it's not, they just didn't want us to know how to read the stars because then they could fool us more. Um, exactly. Use us about what the real date is because this all comes down to a timing of a contract and the contract <clears throat> is, is null and void. If this is correct tomorrow, um, and we, it's interesting because last December, the uh, winter solstice, the 21st, was the uh, beginning of the age of Aquarius, technically. When, Interesting. Uh, when lined up, it was, the, it was the same, it was the same, I can't remember if it was Saturn, Jupiter that lined up in a certain way. And in some places of the world, you could actually see almost what looked like the star of Bethlehem when they lined up. And so that kind of marked the door opening into um, the age of Aquarius. Now, if you guys are familiar with astrology and how this stuff works. It doesn't just change overnight. The door takes a couple of years to fully open. And as, as the timelines change, the old system has to go away, has to have a slow death. Basically the age of Pisces has to kind of dissolve. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the matrix dissolve, you know? So and it's, it's kind of painful. Like it's like, um, maybe it was Janine. I can't, somebody explained it almost like childbirth. You know, like when you're in the throes of labor, that amount of pain is just excruciating. But then once we're the in the third stage of that childbirth, because I can feel those contractions every <laughs> minute. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that it's painful. But then once the baby comes uh, out, it's joy. Right. And so yeah. that's kind of where we are right now is um, Chantel from Aquarius Rising Africa described it as uh, like a, a cocooning. Like you got the caterpillar, the cocoon, and then the butterfly. And we're in that cocooning phase of transitioning into the butterfly. So it's super fascinating. We know that everything has divine timing. Um, I, 
the, the possibilities that I have had to consider this week alone. And Stephanie knows because we've talked about this offline, some stuff we can't talk about on YouTube because we would get our channels taken down. Um, but there, uh, there's this idea of these like astro levels of connection as well. And that has just like blown my mind. Just the fact that souls connect, not just on the earthly level, but in the astro level too. And I know some people are aware of this and can consciously remember all this stuff. I'm not at that point yet, but I know Stephanie, we've had some pretty interesting conversations around that. Yes. And the, the merge of these timelines with different people in our lives that are showing us a different angle of reality, whether they know it or not. Um, that we didn't even entertain before this because everything was so like linear in our lives. And so like on this earth plane, but part of my understanding with the age of Aquarius is in my own perception is that some of these um, different levels of existence are going to merge into one and what that looks like. I have no idea. I don't know what that looks like, but and that's why it's been such a strange week because I know both for Stephanie and I on a, on a personal note are having some weird interactions with people. Weird who, downloads. Yeah. Yeah. It's very strange. I mean, we've, we've had each other crying, laughing, haven't we at some of the yeah. awkwardness of everything and um, just in tears, just at giggling because it's just like, what the hell's happening? A lot of confusion around certain things too. Like I won't go into it, but. Yeah, yeah yeah it's it's wild it's it's so uh, this is it's all i keep saying was like this is effing wild this is so weird you know I, i'm like this is just mm -hmm. I, I don't but then but think about it if, if the reality we're walking into in this new timeline is so drastically different <coughs> from understanding from the old timeline we can't we can't be introduced to it all at once because it would put yeah. us into like trauma like ptsd well i almost feel like we're getting you know, people who are aware that are getting downloads, it's kind of like hitting us little by little, not, not like you get like little bits and pieces. It's like uh, a puzzle pieces. And then as time goes along, you start fitting the puzzle pieces together and you start almost remembering my, my husband's leaving. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you start putting the puzzle pieces together and uh start it's almost like remembering past lives yet merging with people in this lifetime that you're like wait a second i know her or i know him but not in this lifetime and then you start pu putting those puzzle pieces together it's so weird and then the essence of those relationships and the unveiling of of this past person it's interesting because in the law of one uh, they talk about this concept of the wanderers, which we've spoken about on my channel before, um, that the earth itself, whatever the hell, what, whatever the earth is, like that is, I have no effing clue what we're standing on right now. That would be ever. cool if it was like a giant turtle or something. <laughs> I've never thought, if, I'm 38, damn 38 years old. Y'all, I'm going to be 39 in February. I'm pushing 40. And here I'm going, what are we standing on? Like, I, you know, if you had ever told me that I would be questioning that, then um, yeah. I told you I was cr you were crazy. But now I'm like, no, I have no idea what this is. What, what are we standing on? What, what's a planet? You know, um, so a lot of things are, are kind of losing their, their hold, their placeholder in my, my brain. I'm sure in a lot of people watching's brain as well. Mm -hmm. And we know that this, this construction of time is a man-made construction. Like we know that like right now we're filming, today is Thursday, even though this is airing on Friday, this is Thursday, 12.09 p.m. on the East Coast for Stephanie and myself. That's a man-made time. And we need that to an extent. We would not be able to do Zoom videos if we didn't have a concept of time, you know? But that concept is not, is not really real. Does that make sense? It's an illusion. It's an illusion. And so we, we talk about like past lives when we've lived in these other bodies um, as our souls. And we've had these relationships with other people who were also in other bodies and now are new bodies. It's like, but is that timeline even as we know it as linear as we think it is? Or are all these essence of that, infer of that, that being going to be kind of colliding into one, <clears throat> one thing? in the new age. I don't know. I have no idea. Like that's what's so wild because, you know, um, I mean, I can't really talk about too much about what's happened this week, but, um, there's certain people that I, Stephanie, I have a lot in common, certain people we've been meeting where we're like, 
this is strange. Like there's a strange like dynamic here that I, I don't understand completely, but I, I don't know. It's just, it's just something I'm not expecting. I'm not used to. And so it's, it's just very weird. And I know the concept of the wanderers is that we all decided to come back together uh, the group of wanderers to help the earth push from 3d to 40. And so therefore we made these contracts with each other. Um, mm -hmm. And most of us are meeting each other later on in our lives or what would be like the middle of our lives, because this task is so big that we needed the first half of our lives away from these other people just to kind of go through a training day almost to get ourselves ready. Um, mm -hmm. But then again, if, if our timeline is going to be extended as far as our life's capacity, then we're still babies. If we're going to be going back to biblical ages, which is over a hundred years for per life, then we're still in infancy as you know, we're still young. I wonder if one of us will be like Methuselah out of the first Testament. He lived to 900 and some odd years old. He's like a human Yoda. Yeah. Well, that, <laughs> that was Noah too. Didn't Noah live 900 years or something? Well, they, I think he was 800 and I could be wrong. I, I used to 800, 900, <laughs> a lot of hundred years. You stop, you stop counting. Several hundred uh, years. You know, but it, it's interesting in the book of Jubilee, they actually talk about this. They talk about this concept that um, Lucifer is the God of death of mortality. And when we decided whether you believe again, the garden of Eden is a real thing or was a metaphor doesn't really matter. In my opinion, which one you believe the point is that we, um, we decided to go through the school of understanding good versus evil. So that's why God gave the keys to the kingdom over to Lucifer, because we decided we chose to go down this path. And so it was kind of like tough love. But with that came mortality because Lucifer is the God of death. And so we had to go through mortality um, through a circle of life, a cycle of life. Now that's our physical bodies. And everything that goes with the physical body, which is fear, jealousy, hatred, all that kind of stuff. Um, but our soul can't, it can't die. Energy can never be destroyed or created or created. It's just, it just is what it is. And so it keeps hopping into these different bodies as it keeps moving down the timeline. But in the book of Jubilee, it also says once it's flipped again, then we will be restored back to these light bodies, which will live, will live longer. And that's reiterated in the book of Revelation. If you read uh, chapter 22, I believe it is. This goes into uh, there will be no more death. Your tears will be wiped away. Um, you, you will not need the sun anymore because the throne of God is will light, will light the earth or something like that. I was actually just reading it, and I'm like, that's interesting. Our sun changed. Yeah. Well, recently. you know, there's, people are seeing two, two suns now. And it's, there's a yep. shift that's happening. So, um, <clears throat> it's so freaking bizarre. Like, and just to stop and think for a second, we're living in these biblical times, like where this huge event is going to happen. And, um, I wasn't going to share this, but I think I should, I just feel a push to share it. I shared with you already. I pulled cards on what the rapture of earth would be like, because there's all these people saying things like, um, like earth herself has to ascend mm -hmm. along with humanity. And this is the first time humanity will actually be alive to witness it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, is that going to hurt? Are we going to feel like tingly? Are we going to like, what are we going to physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually feel? So I pulled cards on it. And what was interesting was it was one of those readings where, you know, being a new reader, it flew off the cards at me. Like, wow, that's it. And it was what I felt like I got was when it happens, our heart chakras are going to line up and we're going to have this pure love we've never even had before. Um, and that's when we'll know it won't hurt. It will just feel like this pure love, so deep, pure love that it's, it's so intense, almost like to the brink of like happy tears. You know, when you're like so excited and you just like looking at somebody and you just love that person so much, like, like, for instance, my dogs, you know, your dog. You know, when they see you, it's just nothing but pure um, loyalty and love. And I just feel like that is going to open up. It's going to all be unblocked because I think that's one of the biggest chakras that's blocked. Yeah. Well, I was telling you last night, it's interesting because we, we were 
texting about this and we have with the chakra system, we also have um, the Bunda system, which is something that not a lot of people know about, but it's something that we massively work with and study in yoga. And you have your uh, seven chakras in your system, but you have these three different bundas. You have so Muladhara is the chakra of the base of, of, of your body, but Mulabanda is the lock. And then in the stomach, you have what's called Uriana Bandha, which is the pulling up of the navel. And then in the throat, you have Jalandhara Bandha. So when you see people doing breathing exercises, a lot of times they're tucking their chin down. A lot of meditation is done this way because this locks in Jalandhara Bandha. But by locking in the Bandha here, it opens up the passageway in the back of the spine, which hmm. um, in our spine, we have what's called Shashumna Nadi. So we have 75,000 nadis in our body. And they're like little, like, if you think about creeks, they're like little creeks of energy. They all, the main one though is Shashumna. You also have that two that come through the nostril, but Shashumna is like the Mac Daddy. And so you think of it like we were talking about the Mississippi River, right? So you think about this Shashumna nadi running up and down the spine like a river. And if you watch river, river knows how to flow its energy. Like it knows how to flow the water, right? Well, long Shashumna is where you have all these places called chakras, which all have different energetic points. Um, and then you have these two patterns of energy as well called pranic energy and aponic energy. So pranic energy is upward rising energy. It's like it's the inhale, it's the lifting up. Aponic energy is downward. It's a pushing down of energy. And they're constantly yo-yoing within your body. Now, what's interesting is that church will say, oh, this is demonic. But something aponic would be like going to the bathroom, a pushing down, having a baby is upon it's demonic to have a bowel movement. <laughs> right, right. It's that need. For, oh, for my God. Had, I've never had a baby. But for you have, Stephanie. I've heard yes, from I my have. sister. When women have babies, they feel that just need to push down that takes over their body. This energy just whoof. That's the aponic energy. And women... <laughs> women are are considered to be aponic we are ruled by because the aponic energy is its symbol is the moon so that's why that's where we get the word month from moon so um that's why we have cycles once a month is because we're ruled by the aponic energy men on the other hand are ruled by the pranic energy by the sun that's why men have more upper body strength than women you know, a man, it's easier for a man to do pull-ups without practice where a woman is like, Ooh, you know, they can't, it's because they're pranic. They're more active. They're more like out to like to protect. Um, and pranic is ruled by the sun, the solar energy. Okay. And so men have a cycle every three months, you know, men do get their man period, like every three months. You that know? explains a lot. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? All this ancient I'm gonna knowledge. I have to keep wants... track of my husband now. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I think Todd might be on his right now, but he's a little bad mood today but um anyway uh it's okay he has to deal with me once a month so it's fine <laughs> but uh but within the woman and the male do even though the woman is ruled by the aponic energy she also still carries pranic energy within the man he still has aponic energy as well and so it's learning through the bundas through the locks of energy how to control that flow where it comes and lights up the chakra system as it's going up and down the spine and so we have not been taught any of this no, this, you know, and, and so, um, I, there's a, so the type of yoga that I practice, I'll tell you a really funny story. The type of yoga I practice is a very intense form. Traditional yoga is extremely intense. Um, people lose a lot of weight. We actually have a joke where we call people ashtangorexic because they get so skinny doing that. It's just so intense. Um, Sign me up. <laughs> in the second series, which is the intermediate <laughs> series, there's all these really deep backbending because it's all about opening that, that, that up. All right the nervous system, because it's also connected to the nervous system as well. Well, there's a real deep back bend called Kapotasana that people have written blogs about because that's how traumatic this, this one posture is where you're on your knees and you go backward and you catch your ankles and you kind of make what's like a horseshoe. It's a very intense back bend. And um, when I first started practicing you, you, in a traditional yoga, you don't just do whatever postures you want to do. You have to be given them to do a posture that you're not given is considered stealing. Um, there's a system. It's not just a free flow where you're doing whatever you want. The teacher's not, not choreographing it. There's already a system in place of these asanas. So anyway, second series, um, this back bend, I was having a real hard time with. And, um, the first big teacher I worked with before I started going into India with this posture pulled me into this back bend. 
um, in, a, in class. And I had such a reaction. I came out and smacked him in the face because I had such a reaction. He was fine. It was cool. It was all good. But then after that, every time I did it, I would have this like popping sound in my chest and it would kind of hurt. Like it was like, it would startle me and I would sit there and think what the hell is happening. And I, nothing was going on. It was all fine. Um, and then over time it just stopped, but what was happening is things were loosening in that energy cycle because mm -hmm. the human body, the nature of the body is the action, the Shakti of the soul. And so that's why the body carries all this information. And I think that you're right. I think, especially when we're can't help, but have a light body, a body that's not ruled by, by basically by mortality, then mm -hmm. that whole energy cycle will start to, to shift and change. Um, and then we know how to control our energy, how to control our bunda, our locks, um, and within our body that we can actually get like the river controls, like nature controls it. They know how to like hold that energy and then release it when they need to. Um, you know, think about like when you have to go to the bathroom really bad and you have to hold it, you have to learn how to hold it. So kids have to learn that, don't they? When they're potty trained, yeah. they have to learn how to hold it. That's learning how to lock the bunda. You know, but if you, if you don't have something like you don't have to go to the bathroom or you're not in the middle of labor just to be able to hold it on its own. It's like when you see uh, athletes actually do this without even knowing it. It's like when you see like a gymnast do um, a handstand or if you see a dancer leap on the stage, they do it with such ease and grace, even though it's hard. It's because they have that control and their body to be able to control it. Um, it's, yeah. it's pretty incredible what the, the I mean, Janine says that the, we're magical. We're magical. The church don't want us to know that, but we are, we're magical. No, no we're magical. So anyway, that's just a little side, side note. We weren't planning on talking about that, but there you go. You can look up your bundas when you get off this and figure, start figuring out your locks. Look up your bundas, that's cute. <laughs> <laughs> or you can go find a teacher, find a teacher to teach them to you. Uh, we work with them with a lot in my shala. We, we work with the bundas a lot. So, um, but anyway, we are going to be talking today about our dear old friend from the Old Testament, aren't we? One of them. Yeah. Mr. Moses. Yep. Is he Moses or is he someone else? That is the question. So, yeah. So I'm just going to put this disclaimer out there. I'll give you guys the information, but go on your own, do your own research, and then you can decide from there. Um, because there is a lot of similarities with this biblical character that we've come to know in love as the man who freed the slaves from Egypt. Um, <clears throat> we had talked about on my particular uh, channel, and I, I think I've mentioned this on yours too, about we, we went over what a man really means, correct? Okay. Yep. So just to kind of uh, go back to that real quick, a man was put into the biblical text. Um, and we know now that amen does not mean, and so it, and, and so it, and so be it. It means amen, Ra coming from the sun God, amen, Ra. Now, the person who put that particular wording into the biblical text was Moses. So this is kind of where I went on this little journey about who is Moses, because two things kind of gave me a little bit of a red flag about him. And now that we know that our biblical texts have been manipulated, probably more than we actually know, um, <clears throat> is this whole uh, concept of putting amen into the biblical text and also the uh, rod with the snakes going up the serpents as our medical symbol is that Cassidy's or the rod of uh, Sclepius. And so the other thing too, he had inserted into the text as well was the name of God being Adonai. So Ad Adon means Lord. But if you take the Egyptian T and you, the T is actually a D in the Hebrew tongue. So that would be Adonai. But if you put it back into the Egyptian um, way of saying it, it actually is a ton sun god um <clears throat> and atan means solar disc which is the sun and the plural for adan so okay so adan is adonai is plural for adan meaning my lord adonis is the greek pagan god and adan adonis i mean or adonai adonai is singular used 
by the, Phoen the Phoenicians for their pagan god Tammuz, which is the origin of the Greek pagan god Adonis. So if you take all of these different sun god deities, they all like interconnect. Um, according to the Talmud, Moses left Egypt after killing an Egyptian at age 18. He fought on the side of the Ethiopian king. After he won, Moses became popular. When the king died, Moses became a new king. We were not told he was a king. So I'm just going to read a little bit here from, so I, I got all this information from um, multiple different websites um, to make sure they all like collaborated and like said the same thing, right? Um, this was just the most easy way of saying all this because it's kind of a mouthful. There's a lot of information about this. There's more than you would think on this. Um, during the reign of Pharaoh Akhenaten was able to abolish the complex pantheon of the ancient Egypt religion and replaced it with a single god, Atan, who had no image or form. Now, that's very, very similar. What we're told, God has no image and no form. And we are told that, you know, our, our faith is monotheistic. Um, just like he took the polytheism and made it monotheistic. Um, Egyptian-born Ahmed Osman believed that he has been able to find the answers for these questions, which bewildered scholars for centuries. He claims that Moses of the Bible is no other than King Akhenaten, who ruled Egypt for 17 years in the mid-14th century B.C. Amen details the events of Moses or Akhenaten's life, how he was brought up by Israelite relatives and ruled Egypt for 17 years. Angered by many of his subjects for replacing the traditional Egyptian pantheon with worship of Atan and found and was forced to uh, abdicate the, the throne, retreating to exile in Sinai with his Egyptian and Israelite supporters. He died out of sight of his followers. So obviously we can see some parallels there. Um, and what's interesting is they kind of flip-flopped who raised Moses. So we're told that he was born from an Israelite family, put in a basket in the Nile, and was drawn out of the water, hence the name Moses, um, by Pharaoh's daughter and was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. But in actuality, it looks like from what this is saying, that um, he was Egyptian, but was raised by Israelite relatives. Interesting. Guess, gotta mirror everything, right? Osman reveals the Egyptian components of the monotheism preached by Moses, as well as his use of Egyptian royal and Egyptian religious expression. He shows that even the Ten Commandments um, betray the direct influence of spell 125 in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. So let's so let's just get this straight. So for those who grew up Christian, <coughs> we talked about this with Joseph in the Technicolor Dream Code. I did a whole breakdown on that. So that's how, according to the Bible, the um, people from the land of Canaan, which we get Canaanite from, which was the Israelites ended up in Egypt was because of Joseph um, and that story. And I'll put, I'll put a link to that down in the description box below. If you missed that, if you don't, if you're not familiar with that, and that's how the uh, Jewish people grew and they were not called Jewish people back then. Cause that comes from the land of Judah, which happened after a while. Anyway, Anyway, the people from the land of Cana ended up in Egypt. Now, I know from um, my study into Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat that this was not uncommon, that there's a lot of historical references of, I mean, they're right beside each other. They, they're just literally right beside each other, of, of them kind of interworking together. They weren't all slaves. Some of them had high-ranking positions like Joseph um, had a high-ranking position. However, the story goes that we were told is that... Um, all of a sudden, the people of the land of Canaan living in living in Egypt started to outnumber the actual Egyptians. 
And so they enslaved them into um, the Pharaoh's dynasty as, as, as being workers, laborers. And then of course, that's how, where we get the Passover from, right? Because the angel of death, came through and y'all know that story but we were told that when that happened because moses was born a boy that his mother put him in a basket and sent him down the river and he was picked up by one of the pharaoh's daughters the princess and she raised him as her own son now according to all the remakes in the bible he didn't actually even realize that he was an egyptian until he grew up correct that's what we're told but what we're saying from the research is that no he was actually born egyptian correct but he was not hebrew no he was egyptian and he was raised by israeli relatives which leads me to believe that israelites and egyptians were mixing yeah well that, 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 lines. that, that makes sense from um from what I've read when well, my study of the jo story of Joseph is that that was historians and scholars, archaeologists are like that was very common. They were neighbors. Yeah. We know that in, in Egypt alone, like historically speaking, that even though Egypt is technically in the continent of Africa, it kind of stands separate as its own kind of thing because uh uh, people like I have Coptic <coughs> like people of Egypt were all different races and all sorts of different uh, you know perhaps even alien we see the long heads you know egypt was a very mystical place and so so i just wanted to clarify that so in the egyptian book of the dead is a very famous book and that was wild when you told me i guess what you're going to get into with the egyptian book of the dead so i'm going to let you take it away there's a image that i had sent you i'm not sure if you can put it up it's um the oh. uh the prayer okay uh, well the our father prayer originates from that um and uh also the ten commandments also originated so but the difference is so this is interesting so the commandments that come from the book of the dead are actually negative confessions and this is something that they believed in egypt you die and then you meet your maker um the sun god that they that they uh, worship in that you had to um, confess these negative confessions. Um, so for instance, like the 10 commandments will say thou shall not steal, but a negative confession would be, I have not stolen. So these are things that they believed they would say in front of the uh, almighty judge um, at the time of death. Um, and I'm just gonna read off a few of these so the audience can get an understanding of just how similar to the Ten Commandments these are. Um, so a few of them are, I have not committed sin. I have not committed robbery with violence. And I thought about, so it's okay to commit robbery without violence. <laughs> I have not stolen. I have not slain man nor a woman. I have not uttered lies. I have not committed adultery. I have not slandered no man. I have not blasphemed. I have slaughtered no man. I have uttered no curses. So you can see there's a, a, a striking similarity to these two, you know, I guess laws, rules, whatever you want to call them. Um, so that's another similarity between the two. Um, as far as the birth of Moses goes, we're going to just get into that real quick. Um, Akhenaten was born in the year of 12 of his father, Amen. Hatip, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, the 3rd of 1394 BC in the Summer Royal Palace in the border city of Zar in northern Sinai. Zawar, modern Kantara East, was the center of the land of Goshen where the Israelites dwelt. And in the same location where Moses was born, in the, sorry, in the same location Moses was born. Contrary to biblical account, Moses was born inside the royal palace. His mother, Queen Ty, had an elder son, Tuth, Tuthmosis, who died a short time before Akhenaten's birth. Tuthmosis had, that sounds like a disease, Tuthmosis, <laughs> had been educated and trained at the royal residence in Memphis. Memphis, Egypt, not Tennessee. <laughs> Before, before his, by that. <laughs> you're like oh wait what <laughs> um <clears throat> before his mysterious 
before he mysteriously disappeared, believed to have been kidnapped and assassinated by the Amun priests. Fearing for his safety, his mother, Tai, sent him by water to the safekeeping of her father's Israelite family outside the walls of Zaur, which was the origin of the baby in the basket story. This gets weirder and weirder and weirder as we're deep diving into these stories. <laughs> I'd, I'd really like to ask the cards here. How, what's the percentage of the Bible that's actually manipulated? <laughs> you want to? We'll pull them out and see. I don't know how to read percentages in cards. We can ask Janine next. We'll ask Janine. Yeah. 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 But, but honestly, every time I hear like the true story of things, I'm just like, oh, yeah. That's the truth. That's the <coughs> it truth. feels like the truth. Because like I said in the beginning of this video, there's something that felt very off about Moses for the, like the last six months. I've been really thinking about this, like because I've been doing a lot of research on the rod of uh, Asclepius, which is like I said, that that a symbol that we know as the uh, the medical symbol with the rod with the snakes. So that was like a big red flag to me. Like, OK, that same exact symbols on Baphomet. Yeah. And so, if you all missed the episode from last week where we really went into this, I'll put a link down in the description box below as well. Yeah. Cause that's important to understand. Like, like I said, it's a big red flag to me. And then you have all this other stuff. So I'm at the point now where I'm pretty convinced that they're probably the same entity, but well, I think we'll know for sure later on. Um, but the reason the priest's hostility to the young prince was the fact that Ty, his mother was not the legitimate heresis to the throne. She couldn't therefore be accepted as a consort for the state god Amun. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to skip over a little bit of information that really not relevant here. Um, young Akhenaten appeared in the capital city Thebes for the first time when he reached the age of 16, where he met his wife, Nefertiti, his half sister daughter of Sidamon for the first time and they fell in and fell in love with her so again you get that like bloodline mixing of the same blood and Aphrodite is a very famous Egyptian ruler and who you told me this who was their son King Tut King Tutankhamun yep very interesting um let's see at the gathering at the gathering Akhenaten Akana, and produced his scepter of war power which he had taken with him to exile and performed some secret rituals hmm <laughs> and which only the king had the knowledge of once they saw the scepter and I'm talking, this is the whole rod with the snakes on it of Royal authority in Akhenaten's performance. The wise men fell down in abjur abjuration in front of him and declared him to be the legitimate King of Egypt. Ramses, however, who was in control of Egypt refused to accept the wise men's verdict and decided to establish his rule by force. So now we're gonna you know hmm. what? So Ramses is the the fair as a um, the pharaoh they tell you was in charge when Moses was. That is something they do tell you. It was Ramses was. So they're telling you a little bit of the truth. They're not telling you the whole truth, are they? Mm -mm. No, they were both at fault. Yeah. Well, can we let's hit on this for a second because this is something you and I have talked about off air before, and I've been a little bit nervous to present this on my channel because I know it's going to ruffle some feathers. Um, and my Todd and I have talked about this a lot too, because um, Cassiopeians, I believe, talk about this. Do we think there's a different God in the Old Testament from the New Testament? I think so. Me too. I'm starting to think that that the God of the Old Testament sometimes there's like a battle going on between the authority figures of the Old Testament is not the same as the New Testament. I think there's a mixture, but I think a majority of it. Like, how many times do you read? And I got to be very careful how I say this on YouTube. But how many times do you read in the Old Testament about uh, sacrificing? And now that our eyes are open, what what it's not like giving up TV for a day. No, 
I'm not sacrificing uh, a week's worth. Like I'm not, it's, it's a different type. If you get where I'm going with that, right. it's a, it's a, you know, removing a life force from the planet. Yeah. And yeah. you read that so many times, especially in Exodus or um, Leviticus. I know the, 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 the church is going to tell you Leviticus is boring. Go read it. Yeah, no, it's telling you the truth about what's happening. Well, and that's what um, my boyfriend sees with the Cassiopeians and the raw materials that are the law of one. It's like there was a battle in the in the, the Old Testament between God and Lucifer. And sometimes it is God speaking, but sometimes it's Lucifer disguised as God. But then there's a clear distinction in the New Testament that now, because the coming of Jesus signified the beginning of the end of 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 lucifer's reign and here's an, another interesting tidbit of information i don't actually think and i still go on the 2000 year pattern because templates that's what we have but in my gut i don't think jesus came 2000 years ago i think it was more like a thousand years ago mm. and i asked janine once that question with the cards and she the cards concurred that he was closer to our life than we than they, we've been told there's been some skewing of, of uh, dates and times and situations. Hmm. So I think that maybe they've just tried to spread out events when really they came closer together. I don't know. Well, so, how many times did he say, I'm coming up, I'm coming back very, very soon. And I know that soon is a little different in the spirit realm than versus our soon. But 2,000 years, I don't know how soon that is in the spirit realm, but he says that over and over and over again. I will in, be back soon. Yep, and in the apocalypse <coughs> of uh, Abraham, Abraham sees Yahshua. He doesn't know who he is because obviously Abraham lived way before Yahshua, but the coming of this being that we now know as Yahshua was real close to the end of this timeline. Mm-hmm. So it's just interesting, guys. And like, you know, we're just saying this is just information we're going to have to just kind of think about, entertain, because we know we've been so freaking lied to about everything. Everything is one big fat lie. But if everything is one big fat lie, then what's the truth? We have to find the truth now. And so and, and I know from the book of Jubilee, from the missing one of the missing books of the Bible, it's very clear. There's a very clear discussion about this, about this contract between god and lucifer because of us it's our our doing you know so interesting it's just so fascinating it is so and do you know more about the egyptian book of the dead or should we do that no i found it on amazon and christians will probably be up my you know butt for buying it but i want to buy it and i want to read it and just see because i in order to understand we can't stay away from learning we don't i'm not saying practice black magic i'm not saying that we, well, we need to know what exactly it is. We need to have the knowledge of it yeah. to understand the difference between the two things. Exactly. Exactly. It, reading something doesn't mean that you're, you're falling into it. There's no, I want knowledge. I want to see that the 10 commandments come from this is the Lord's prayer in it. You know what? I, I know that now just judging by what I've read online, but I actually want to have a copy of this and who knows if that's also been mistranslated too throughout the years. Cause that's an ancient book. That's probably more ancient than the Bible. Yeah. Um, but like what else is in there that, you know, lines up with biblical texts? We don't know. So in order for me to find out, I have to read it. I can't just assume. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. knowledge is power. So it's not that I'm going to take this book of dead and, cast spells on anything it's not like that it's, it's just gaining knowledge so that i can understand so that later on if god chooses for me to help educate people especially like what you know i'm going to be doing that deep programming group on on sundays which we'll get into at the very end of this but like that's one of the things i'm going to use is like look at how similar these two religions are yeah you know it's time to program the mind to be open-minded and to start thinking, yeah, I was lied to and it's okay to be angry about it. And I was angry at first too, but then you take that anger and you start to make it, um, you start to become more uh, proactive about it. Okay. Well now I'm going to take this into my own hands and now I'm going to learn. Right. Like, okay. Well, I was lied to. 
and that's what they did, right? That's the that's the the battlefield they placed before us. They um, and I still get it. I still get backlash from people who are still playing the game of the bad guys, where they made you believe that by reading something and looking at something that you are now you know tainted. But they did that. They made you believe that so that you wouldn't look at things, so that you would be dumb and stupid, <coughs> and you wouldn't you know be ignorant to the fact that 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 the Christian church is a Mithraic church. Yep. You know, 100%. 100%. Once you see it, you can't unsee it, but they don't want you to know that, you know, or you'll still, you'll hear like really brainwashed Christians say like, Oh, well the devil created the, the legend of Mithraism to have you doubt the church. That's some stretching. That's some reaching. No, the devil did not create Mithraism just to fool you so that you would doubt the church. Yeah. Mithraism has existed since before, before the birth of the church. Yeah. And they, they it's a satanic sun worship. And the people like Con- like St. Constantine manipulated that so that we, the people, the masses, would be ignorant and continue walking in the way of Mithraism and not the true liberating faith of Gnosis or Gnosticism, which is the true Christianity. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, I, I've said it this morning on like two shows already. It's these people who are so indoctrinated by religious dogma that are going to have the hardest time once the hammer drops, once the great awakening and all we can do, you you can take a horse, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. The you end's know, not for everyone. Yeah. The end's not for everyone. The end's not for everyone. If you love the story of the Bible and you're having a hard time like stepping away from it and observing what's what's been corrupted, then your faith isn't in the faith, but it's in the story. And stories yeah. are just illusions anyway. You know, think about it this way. It's like you believe in Santa Claus all your childhood. You get to that age where you're like, you start questioning, is there this mythical Santa Claus that comes to my house every single Christmas? And it can be devastating for a kid and they can have a little bit of uh, cognitive dissonance. Like, no, no, no. Like, unless you're my child who was like, Santa's a bunch of baloney. I don't care anymore. (laughs) Thank God. Um, Although, although I, I didn't make Christmas all about Santa Claus in my house. So thank God for that. But, uh, <laughs> but it, it's the same thing. It's just like, think of it that way. You know, we're children who believe in Santa Claus and now we're being told Santa Claus doesn't exist anymore. It's the same exact thing. Yeah. But God does. Ex- Jesus exists. Yahshua exists. God exists. These exist. He's better yeah. than what the church makes him. He's He's more loving than the church makes him out to be. It's almost like, to me, it's a relief. It's a weight off my chest. I can't tell you. First of all, I have no fear. Second of all, I feel free. And I have a closer relationship with him now. Yeah. And every relationship with him is unique. My relationship with Yahshua might be different than yours or whoever. So it's because it's like, you know, if my relationship with you as friend might be different than, let's say, Janine or Jean-Claude or someone like that. It's it's the same thing. You're not going to tell, you're not going to have someone tell you, well, your relationship needs to be like this with Janine and Jean-Claude, and, you know, whoever and Stephanie. Like that's, that's Stupid. someone yeah. telling you how to be and how to have a relationship. Right. How does that make any sense at all? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. And that's what, um, you know, it's interesting because, you know, in, when I, on Tuesdays, when I'm on with David, the first hour we do the missing books and the second hour we've been doing, looking at these like fundamentalist CULTs, um, especially coming from the Protestant faith. And one thing I've noticed, even though I grew up like in an evangelical church, um, it wasn't fundy. Like it wasn't, nobody there was like super fundamentalist, you know? Um, but one thing I've noticed doing these deep dives into like Michael and Debbie Pearl, the IBLP, Bill Gothard, like all these different people, uh, Steve Anderson, is that they love the Old Testament. They like love the Old Testament. And then it's like, it's like they're the thing is like the Old Testament with a little bit of Jesus. But it's like the Old Testament. And I've said mm-hmm. on David's show many times that the fundamentalist, in my opinion, the fundamentalist template of faith is satanic because it's all about controlling you a b u s c punishments 
uh, women are not even considered to be human. Fear. Fear. It's a fear template. Um, it's, it's a C-U-L-T, you know? And so now going back and considering things that like Cassiopeians have said on their forum and, and all these deep dives we've done about <laughs> the fact that the Old Testament might be dominated by Lucifer as the God versus the New Testament, where there's a stark, stark difference between the love that then validates for me my why I feel like some of these um, extreme churches, Bundy churches are satanic because they have a love of Lucifer. They, have, they want to inflict pain on people. They want to control people. I don't want to control. Listen, I have a hard time controlling my dog on a leash. Like I am not about controlling anyone. Like, and maybe that's the Aquarian in me. Like we're pretty much like, you do you boo. Like whatever, whatever floats your boat. As long as, as, long as you're not hurting anybody, like cool, live your life, you know? Um, but mm -hmm. the, there's certain people, especially like narcissists, which tend to be people that will lead CULTs that um, a normal, empathetic, compassionate, healthy minded person is not going to end up being a CULT leader. But these types of people, um, in my opinion, like Michael Pearl, like Bill Gothard, like Steve Anderson, in my opinion, uh, they're narcissistic and they love to put vengeance on people because it gives them that narcissistic supply. It gives them that fulfillment, which is them not seeking fulfillment from God. It's seeking it from the powers of Lucifer, which is pulling it from other people, right? If you're, if you're, if that makes sense, it's like, what? that's why they do, that's why the Satanists do the ceremonies they do. You know, it's pulling life force to feed you from other people. Whereas yeah. when you are content with God, you don't feel the need to do that. You don't feel also the need to a it. lot of these televangelists too. You see their, their um, church services and you see all the people fall down and that's spell casting. That's demonic yeah. spell casting. I've never trusted that no matter how um, in depth I was in the church. I, that there was something about that. Um, and I'm on the fence and, just don't shoot me guys, but I'm on the fence about the whole speaking in tongues thing. I don't know about it. I don't know a lot about that. So I, I'm on the fence about it, to be honest. And uh, I guess we'll, we'll find out sooner than later about, you know, what that's all about. Well, in the day, you should never give your power that much over to another human being where they have the capacity to make you fall down like that. You should yeah. never be that engrossed in another human being. Like that's disgusting. That pastor up on that stage is a man you should never be that transfixed by a, a mere man a mere mortal yeah. to the point where they have that yeah. power over you that's scary too and god is not god is not one to sit here and go boo he, he's not no. gonna scare you no um, that's, the angels that's always came to people and like you've said in previous shows they always say don't be afraid i'm here yeah. for the good like they're like knocking afraid. on they're like hey it's me gabriel don't freak out gonna be a big light and i want to scare coming you in. <laughs> coming in you might want to close your eyes i don't want to scare you um are you dressed you know, I don't know. <laughs> um put your clothes on about that sometimes can the angels like see us at all given times like i've heard they can it? somebody asked about like intimacy and um they're like oh the angels just see it like when you see your dog you know doing it with another dog and i'm like that's still so gross <laughs> i don't want to see my dog doing it with some like I think the spirit realm sees that kind of activity a little differently than we do. Yeah. Well, we've also been, our brain has been conditioned to think that that's like dirty and wrong. Yeah. You know, um, it could be, it can be, but it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be because there is such a thing as like sex magic, but if you're doing it, with everything, there's a positive and a negative. If there is an act of love involved in that sharing of energy, because you are sharing each other's energy at that point, especially if you're a woman, you're, you're taking that in. Um, very graphic, I know. So if, there, if you have any kids in the room, you might want to tell them to leave. <laughs> this is a rated R discussion. Um, um, but if it's, if it's in a respectable relationship where there's accountability to each other and a commitment to each other, then it's holy and it's beautiful. You know, but if it's not, if it's like, you know, the whole story about, was it you we were talking about or was it like the whole story about with Mary Magdalene with the seven, you know, Jesus cast seven demons off of her. Or yeah, we were talking about that, I think, yesterday. Yeah, it wasn't demons. It was men that were trying to RAP her. You know, that's <laughs> not, that's not, that's not acts like that. And what they do with children is not holy and sacred. So like anything 
you it's like it's like tarot cards you know like the card is just a card the act is just an act it's the energy and the conduit put into it and so um you know it's interesting i know stephanie and i talked about the thing we talked about was on the phone um because of the weirdness that ex i experienced last week and one of my favorite television series of all time is is American Horror Story. Now I know I, when I first started watching American Horror Story, I didn't know anything about this group of this bunch, this group of people, you know, now I do understand that those who run that are not the best people with the best of intentions. However, knowing that if you go back and watch it, you can see what they're telling you because part of the rule is they have to tell you what they're going to do. They have to tell you the truth in some form. And so if you go back and watch American Horror Story, you're going to see some truth into what's happening. And there's um, season eight, which is called Apocalypse. It's one of my favorite seasons, season three and season eight. They kind of merge together. And the Apocalypse season, which came out long before 2020, really has a lot of uh, mirrors of what's happened with us. Underground bases. There's this BOMB that's released that people can't survive it. And the ant the, the, they have the emergence of the Antichrist. Yeah. By the way, the guy who plays the Antichrist is really hot. FYI. Anyway, <laughs> for for people who like good to know, yeah. But what? But but the, if, if the Antichrist is an actual person, it probably would be somebody that was really good looking. Um, yeah. Well, that's what the rumors went around. Like, be aware of a very very handsome, stunning looking man. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, Jesus wasn't good looking. We also hear that too. Yeah. But who, any, who cares? Who cares? Yeah. Well, in, in the in the in the um, season eight of Apocalypse, I was telling Stephanie this. There's this coven of good witches that are from season three that come back, and they're the only ones that can defeat the Antichrist. And what's interesting is that you know when we talk about like dark magic, black magic, serving Lucifer, ser serving God, whatever, whatever. Um, a lot of the tools that both sides are using are the same tools. They're learning the same type of things. They just have to choose in which way they're going to use these tools, if that makes sense. And so the women of, and men, there's some warlocks too in that. You know, name is just a name. I mean, I mean, a rose by, what did Shakespeare say? A rose by any, any other name would smell just as sweet. So you can call it a witch, you call it a light, light worker, whatever. There are these people that know that have this education, that have this information about spiritual warfare. And so they are the only ones that can defeat the Antichrist at his own game because they understand how to use light working to defeat the darkness. You flip a light switch on, all of a sudden the darkness runs, right? And so I was, I had this like epiphany and I, I think I told you something. I was like, holy crap, this is why, this is why the church, which is part of the, the dark group, the dark bunch, they're part of the, they're a part of it. Everything, all these have told us to stay away from spiritualism because they don't want us to have that education because if we don't know how to defeat the Antichrist, they win. Correct? But a lot of us- well, I think God talks to us in our, in, in shows too. Yeah. Because to, nothing is coincidence. <clears throat> I mean, that's just, I mean, and we, I think a lot of us have gifts. A lot of us have, I know I've had some things happen. You have, I think a lot of people watching have noticed they have some spiritual, what we call gifts, which are just abilities that God has given you and people in the world try to make you feel like you're crazy or you're, you're, you know, the devil's getting to you, you know, no, your intuitive knowing your sovereignty and that light is what's going to defeat this group. You know, um, Janine says it a lot. We are the white hats. Mm -hmm. We are. There's a military group, yeah, but we are as well. We it's are. It's a group well. effort. It's a group effort, and that's what you see in season eight of American Horror Story. It's a group effort of all these women who are of all different walks of life that come together because they they've had the education, they've had the educate, they know how to do this, they've had that education. We just never had the education. Only the that budge did. Does that make sense? I know I'm going to probably get a lot of hate emails from that because people are still so indoctrinated. Well, you're standing in your truth, so that's yeah. on them to decide. It's on them. This is yeah. this is all based off of you know our own opinion and what we're researching and what we're seeing and you our know. prayers, our meditation, like what uh and, and the more that you the more I feel like and I know you've Stephanie you were with the church a lot longer than I was, 
But the more you step away from the control of dogma, the freer you are and the more sovereign you feel in your own relationship with God. You know? Yeah. And no stones that people throw at you because you decided to leave. That I will say this. I used to be very, um, what's the word? I'm trying to think of the correct word to use for this. I almost, when I was in the church, there was times I almost felt like I had a demonic entity, not possess me, not attached to me, but almost attached, if that makes sense. Like trying. Yeah. Like. You carried a weight. There was a weight that you. There was a weight, but it came along with, I was temperamental. I was angry a lot. I was, um, there's a lot of fear in me. And um, when I broke away from this, I don't have a bad temper at all. Um, I am happier most of the time. I am brave. I no longer carry that fear. So what, I mean, what does that tell you? Yeah. If the church was creating me to have all these negative emotions and negative thought processes and and now I feel free and I'm broke of it and I am a better person for it. It's almost like there is spell casting when you go to church, not saying that the pastor or the priest or they're aware of what they're doing. Cause I think a lot like my previous pastor, not aware at all. And I, I can confidently say that, but the things he said, looking back on it now, definitely putting you in a state of fear putting you in a state of um, not being good enough. Well, not thinking there's anything to you. Like we're just a speck of dirt. Um, yeah. We're nothing. Um, but he would encourage you to use your spiritual gifts. But, but somebody told him that I started using a pendulum and well, that's not of God. Who said, so, but you told me to use my spiritual gift. <laughs> Yeah, and who says a pendulum is not of God? I don't see that in the Bible well, at all. If, As far as I know, the uh, stone or the crystal or whatever that creates it was created by God. Yeah, that's an amethyst. And can it be used for evil? Absolutely. But it can also be used for light. And the thing is, before I use any tools, I always um, do like a blessing and ask that any energy or anything that I get downloaded uh, spiritually um is from a source of light preferably the divine creator um and i always i always ask that prior to using anything whether it's cards the the pendulum it doesn't matter i always ask um a blessing of uh anything that is being told to me discerningly that it's of the light and that no darkness is allowed i do not consent to any dark entities uh feeding me information yeah I do the same thing. And the thing about pendulums, here's my pendulum. And Tamara's talked about this before. Now, pendulums, what they do is they read your energy. So they read from your higher self, your subconscious knowing. And so like when I ask a question to my pendulum, the question has to be strictly about me. All right. It can't be, I can't sit there and say, or if it's about somebody else, it's something, it's something to do with an interaction within my energy, if that makes sense. So like, I can't. Got to be connected to you. Yeah, I can't sit here and say, you know, is my neighbor going to have baked beans for dinner? No, it doesn't work that way. The pendulum is literally reading your higher self. Is that guy, down, does the guy down the street have a crush on me? No, because if you haven't interacted with that person, then you're not sharing energy, if that makes sense. So I know Tamara spoke about this as well. You can't use the pendulum on anybody else but yourself because it's reading your energy. This thing is reading your energy from your higher self, your subconscious, your gnosis or knowing. And we deeply know the answers to every question, even if our conscious mind isn't aware of it. And so the pendulum helps clarify all of that. It's not an end all be all. It's not something um, my boyfriend was saying the other day that he had a friend that used to annoy him because everything she did in her life, she would ask the pendulum. And he was like, dude, just come on, let's go, go get food. You know, it's not. Well, it's interesting that you say it's from your higher self, because oftentimes I can actually predict the answer to it. Me too. And it's just a confirmation that I do know. Yeah, there's been sometimes I've been so like my pendulum swings around in a circle for yes, up and nose and up and down for no. So 
Okay, so let me ask this question. So let's see. Am I divinely protected? Yes. We already asked these questions. I don't know if you can see my hand. I just want to see this. I'm not moving it. Am I divinely protected, Pendulum? Can you be very, very, very clear? Thank you so much. Stop, please. Stops. Are we in danger from any type of black hat? Starting to swing back and forth. No. There's that back and forth swing. No. Thank you. Please stop. Thank you. So it reads my energy. And that's the only thing the pendulum is doing. Now, I already know we're divinely protected. I already know we're safe. Like, I'm not, you know, this is something I already know, but you're right. Because sometimes I'll ask it a question about something. And right as I'm in my, my if I, you know, if I'm at home by myself, I might ask it out loud verbally, but I don't let my boyfriend think I'm crazy. So sometimes I'll just say it in my head. And before the question's even done, I'm done saying it. It's already starting to go in the direction of the answer either back and forth or around because yeah. I'm reading my energy. And so that is so, so, and we know, so if you think that that's wrong, then you're saying that having a soul is wrong because the soul knows that's the energy we're talking about is the energy of the soul, the higher self. It's all the same thing. So absolutely. Absolutely. But if you had something like this, that you're confident in to, to like validate your own, your own inner knowing, then guess what you don't need? pastor or preacher nobody is nobody has the right to tell you what to think exactly and nobody has the right to tell you how to pray how to do things how to have your as you were saying earlier how to have your relationship with god no one can tell i you. hate the whole ritual and, and anybody can have a ritualistic prayer life and that's fine like you said you do you boo kind of a thing yeah I personally don't like it for me. I've never been into it. I've tried. And honestly, it's just like, I'd almost dread it. It felt wrong to me. And it's just like, well, what exactly is prayer? It's communication. I'm not going to go. Um, oh, my you're God. Not, I don't want to. You're not going to go to there. your husband and be like, walk up to your husband and be like, dear David. No, you're just going to talk to him. I in the name God, of okay. Jesus, can you cook me dinner? Yeah. Because I always cook dinner. <laughs> yes, yes. Right? I Yeah, I believe this. I talk to God all day. I'm constantly like in an open dialogue with, with God. I'm never, it doesn't like, always have to be asking for things. Honestly, most of the time, I just compliment God. Yeah, it's not God's like, vending machine. Yeah, like I don't ask a lot, especially for myself. Now, given certain things, things i've been asking protection over light workers worldwide yep. and stuff like that now that's a different story um or if i'm in a predicament you know give me clarity on how to handle this not fix it for me but give me clarity on how i can handle this um but i pray a lot differently than a lot of people even like with the cards to me that's a type of prayer i'm getting answers from the divine mm -hmm. And prayer, I, I've been telling this on my channel, is not always you speaking, it's listening. Yep, that's meditation. We're not taught that. Yeah. And Jesus tells his disciples to, me uh, to meditate. It's in the Bible. Because when you meditate, you're listening. And to have time for yourself, he took time for himself. He always went on the mountain to communicate with uh, God. And uh, we... we we fail to do that nowadays. I'm learning how to do that more. I actually have to have my alone time or else I get really snippy. <laughs> yeah. But that's just being an empath, especially if you're an empath, you need more alone time than not. Um, but yeah, I take time to actually listen. What does God have to say today? Not what blah, 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 blah. I'm not like jabber jaws all day long. But a lot of times, like I said, I'll be like, wow, that the sky looks absolutely stunning like last night i looked at the sun i don't know if you saw it in georgia our sunset looked very bizarre it was very like deep deep red and it looked like the sun was a lot closer than it ever has been it's changing it's it's so weird and i'm just i'm on the phone with my husband i'm, I'm driving home and i well i was snippy with him because i'm listening to my song and all of a sudden he calls me I'm like darn it you're interrupting my song. Like, what do you want? I, you inter, well, I, I'm on the Bluetooth. What do you want? You interrupted my song and I'm driving away and I'm like, whoa, 
whoa. He's like, what, what, what? What's wrong? What's wrong? I'm like, go outside right now. You have to look at the sky. Holy shit. <laughs> it was beautiful. I don't care about the sky. I'm like, this is biblical, David. Go look at the sky. It's biblical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I'm a kook, by the way. <laughs> no, it's okay. The, what, what's that that line from uh, Alice in Wonderland where she's like, am I crazy? And the white rabbit's like, it's okay. Some of the best people are crazy or something. I don't know. There's a great, there's a great quote. Uh, even though Alice in Wonderland is a bit of a suspect story in itself. It's, it's a great quote though about like, that's okay. It's okay. Um, so before I know you have to jump on with David, I want to give you a little time before you, you can zone in before you go on that show. You want to uh, give the talk about the support group again? One more sure. time. This in a, in a nutshell, and I'm actually going to be talking about it on Dark Outpost today again. I had a lot of emails saying, can you give me more information? Because I only went over through it briefly on his channel the other day. <coughs> but so far I have two. F I, so this is specifically for there's a woman's group. There's a men's group and there's a deprogramming group. The women's and the men's group is it for it? Could, it doesn't have to be sexual a b u s e. Um, it could be gaslighting. It could be verbal, emotional a b u s e. Um, to, it's it's to help. It's not um, a therapy program or anything like that because I'm not a licensed practitioner. Um, it's just to kind of have some fellowship, talk things over, heal together. I think healing alone is a lot worse than healing together with someone else sharing stories so that we don't feel alone. And um, actually we had our first one the other day, which I think went amazing because it was just like, I'm, I'm realizing that not only is it needed for healing, but it's also in, it's also needed for that social interaction too. Yeah. While um, us people who haven't gotten this are segregated from our families and such, um, or if we don't put the, the diaper on our face. Um, and then you have the deprogramming group and that is, kind of like a lot about what we talked about today. It's this getting out of that state of mind that you have to have a pastor or priest or whoever a rabbi, um, you know, tell you what to do. And it's more of the gnosis or the inner knowing, not the outer knowing EDO. Is that what it's called? Bryce? No. Um, so it's, it goes into that. That's more of like a class type thing that I'm setting up. Cause I'm actually going to be doing um, some like, whether it's storytelling or techniques and stuff like that, that kind of go into like the deprogramming, but it's also to a social group as well. And like I said, I'm not licensed. Um, both of my women's groups are completely full because I'm, I'm limiting how many people per group with that. So people have a chance to talk the deprogramming. I'm allowing a lot more people into, um, and those are also pretty full, but eventually I'm going to be making other groups. I'm in the midst of scheduling a third woman's group um the men's group we need more people we have only a couple in there so if you're a man and you've gone through abo usc come join i have a person that's probably going to be leading that one um if you want to volunteer too to lead a group i need i need help <laughs> send help <laughs> and um it doesn't have to be from a christian faith it could be judaism it could be uh hinduism islam. it could be islam buddhism it doesn't matter what it is if it's an organized religion, you've had issues or you need deprogramming help, um, you can email. Um, it's the 17th letter of the alphabet. And I'll, I'll tell you what, the I'll just put the I'll just put the email address down in the description box yeah. below for okay. you guys. So you Sounds can copy good. And paste it. Yeah. 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 So just I just ask anybody in the audience that emails me, please don't send any long, long story because I, I have to I'm getting like 30 emails a day sometimes. So very short to the point uh what group you want to be part of what time you're interested in or you can you know if you look on my channel i posted the times on my um my channel so you can look at those um if you want to be put on the waiting list for women's let me know and we'll just go we'll hash over the details through the email um but yeah it it's just the baby the baby uh the portion Genesis. of this yeah It'll yeah, we're, we're, change. we're just we're birthing this new uh, thing out and uh, seeing I'm getting my water. I mean, you know, testing the water with this. Um, wow, I got tongue tied there really badly. <laughs> and um, we'll, we'll get everyone in a group somehow. It won't necessarily be me leading it. However, I probably will pop my head in in the beginning stages of this just to make sure things are going well. Yeah.
But I will be leading the women's Wednesday, Friday group, as well as probably another one on Mondays. And then um, I'll be leading both of the deep programming groups just because I've actually deprogrammed myself. So I want to be the one leading that for now until I get other people deprogrammed. So, yeah. yeah. And we're not telling you what to think or feel or believe in that deprogramming. It's just if you're interested in getting out of that, like, dogmatic views. The jail of the mind. The yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. The first jail. Being is. more comfortable understanding that you've been lied to. Yeah. Kind of a thing. So, and then you branch off from there and you get your own personal relationship with your creator and you figure out for yourself what you want to believe. It's pretty much what it's all about. It's amazing. It's amazing. So again, guys, the email address will be down in the description box below. Again, I'll put, like I did in the last video, I'll put all the <coughs> groups so you can just tell uh, Stephanie which groups you want to be a part. You could be more more than one you can do yes. deprogramming in a private gender group whatever you just can't be in men's and women at the same right. time right that makes sense that's logical um and also we she needs to know your time zone as well and perhaps if you're in another country because we are looking for people who speak spanish or french or german or whatever that can um that cause we can't speak those languages and so we want to be able to slowly build this let this be kind of a snowball thing for people helping people it costs nothing no cost so, um, so yeah, so that will all be down in the description box below along with the last week's episode, if you missed it, and along with an old deep dive I did over Joseph in Egypt, and also a link to Stephanie's channel. So if you're not subscribed to Stephanie's channel, please go and hit that subscribe uh, button in her channel. This is kind of her specialty is deprogramming everything from religion into more of a spiritual awakening, which is what the great awakening is really all about is your own personal great awakening with your own spiritual life. Get off those chains that bind you. So, all right, Stephanie. And if, uh, well, actually we're going to be airing this on Friday. So once this airs, you will already have been on the dark outpost but people can also find you on the dark outpost at tuesdays at thursday excuse me at two o'clock as well so if you're part of the dark outpost check stephanie out on thursdays at 2 p.m eastern standard time live where she will be doing more deep dives into more more subjects all right well stephanie we will meet again next week i'm all righty all right i'll talk to you then bye bye